last week's royal tour to the Caribbean. Before we hear again from Rebecca, here's Alice Hare from the Mail's Fashion Desk with her take on Kate's Caribbean style. All eyes were on Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge's wardrobe during her Caribbean tour, which was to be expected, but she really did go the extra mile with her royal outfits this tour um, and showcased what she's become known for, which is diplomatic dressing. So paying homage to the country she visited through her clothes. And the first outfit we're going to talk about of the Duchess's is a perfect example of that. To leave Belize, which was uh, their first stop on the tour, Kate chose to wear the colors of the Belizean flag, which are red and white. And very interestingly, I think this is my favorite outfit of the whole tour, in fact, she chose to wear a vintage YSL belted jacket, which she bought at university, so 20 years ago. However, I would say that the jacket is actually much older than 20 years and was probably vintage when she bought it. It looks quite 1980s to me, those exaggerated buttons, very 80s, and actually something that wouldn't have looked out of place on Princess Diana. She paired this with very wide leg Alexander McQueen white flared trousers, which I loved because they were a really exaggerated wide leg and she is known for wearing a wide leg, but these were a step further and sort of took the look up uh, another fashion notch. And then accessory wise, she had a Mulberry handbag, very classic British brand, which she loves, a pair of Aquazura um, white heeled pumps. Aquazura is an Italian brand. And then a pair of earrings from Anthropology, which is a high street brand uh, featuring oversized pearls and a gold shell. The vintage was especially interesting, the vintage jacket, because um, it's one of the, I think it's the first time, in fact, that she's worn vintage. Um, and this is something which is really close to the, the royal's hearts, especially Prince Charles. He is a real champion of sustainability in fashion. In fact, the Prince of Wales himself wears a lot of vintage. He wears suits from the 1980s. So I thought this was a really interesting statement um, from Kate. Now, the second outfit that I'm going to talk about is the outfit that Kate chose to wear to leave the Bahamas, which was the final leg of the tour. She chose a beautiful primrose yellow floral dress by a British Italian designer called Alessandra Rich. This is, I think, the sixth occasion that she's worn a design by Alessandra Rich. Uh, it's a very vintage inspired brand. Alessandra is known for designing 1940s inspired pieces. And this dress that Kate's wearing here is no exception to that. It's got exaggerated shoulders, a bow detail, um, puff sleeves, a peplum. There's a lot going on and it should in some ways be too much, but it works so well. Her sister Pippa is actually also a fan of the brand, having worn an Alessandra Rich dress to Prince Louis's christening. This is also very reminiscent of a dress that Princess Diana wore in 1983 on her Australian tour. Now, this outfit was a total showstopper. It is a pink metallic dress by the vampire's wife. This is the second time Kate has worn an item by them. She previously wore a green dress in March 2020 on a visit to Ireland. She wore this to visit some Mayan ruins with Prince William. And interestingly, she opted for a clutch bag, which is embroidered with Mayan embroidery. So this is another example of what Kate does best, which is diplomatic dressing. So really nodding to her hosts in the clothes that she chooses to wear. She paired it with a pair of earrings by a brand called Onita. She previously wore these earrings to the James Bond premiere in November 2021. And this outfit is classic Kate. It's pure princess. And pink was actually all over the spring summer 22 catwalks. And I think Kate here is, is nodding to that and showing that you really can be taken seriously and wear pink. Alice Hare there. Let's go back to Rebecca English now before we get to the tour. Tell us, Rebecca, what royal engagement you've been on this morning? Well, I was back at Buckingham Palace doing a royal engagement for the first time in probably almost two years because of COVID. Um, and uh, I was with the Countess of Wessex. She was in the garden at Buckingham Palace planting an elm tree as part of this big nationwide plant a tree for the Jubilee project. It's organised by this group called the Queen's Green Canopy. And what they wanted to do is, as well as the kind of verbal tributes we'll hear to the Queen to mark 70 years of 
on the throne. They wanted a really a lasting living le legacy. So they've encouraged families and schools and communities and individuals up and down the country to, um, to plant a tree, to have this kind of living Queen's green canopy. So Sophie was planting one in the very appropriate setting of uh, Buckingham Palace, along with six school children. It was a really, really fun event. And we've just been looking there at Kate's fashion. Her confidence there really does seem to be just growing and growing, doesn't it? I think it's really interesting that you and other people have noticed this, because I noticed this too, actually. I felt on the, um, on the tour that we've just been on that she was much more assertive, much more confident on the international stage. You know, she was sort of meeting and greeting uh, dignitaries such as prime ministers, governor general. She was instigating conversations with them. She gave two speeches that were really well received and she's become a much more assured public speaker. Um, and I was told uh, by kind of sources of mine that it looks like she might actually start to undertake a few more solo royal tours in the future now she's got these kind of big set pieces under her belt. Um, there'll only be two or three days but it will allow her the chance to focus on issues that she's really interested in such as early years, art, sport and of course being only two or three days as opposed to these bigger trips that we go on with her husband it'll give her the chance to actually do her other job which is actually be a, a mum to three young children. You were on that tour. There were some successes and some perceived mishaps, but now that they're home, how do you think the Cambridges and their staff viewed the trip as a whole? Yeah, so a, lot, a lot's been said and written and discussed about this trip. Um, and I have to say, take it as from someone who was there kind of every step of the way, I think a lot of this has been slightly overblown and there's been a lot of kind of whipping up a frenzy on social media by commentators who quite frankly have an agenda against the couple or the monarchy. Now that doesn't mean there aren't lessons to learn and I know one of the things that's being talked about a lot in the royal household is, is how one of these big set piece royal trips sit, particularly in a part of the world, the Caribbean, where a lot of the country, well, all of the countries they visited are, are former British colonies that now have independence, but ones where the issue of the British role in slavery and reparations and uh, is very much being debated. And also the, there's a strong air of republicanism there as well. These countries are, are looking towards the next steps in their future. So I know one of the things they're looking about is whether they can still do these royal tours, but maybe take out a little bit more of the kind of pomp and the pageantry and make it more about dealing with and seeing how they can help people and organisations on the ground. And one of the major events came right at the end, didn't it, with William's statement saying his future as head of state and head of the Commonwealth is, quote unquote, for the people to decide. How was that received? This is quite an unprecedented statement by William, and I think it was quite fascinating. So maybe a little bit of context. I know him and his staff were discussing, saying something at the end of the tour, maybe kind of giving a few remarks to kind of wrap up with his thoughts and what the highlights were. But, you know, while William doesn't read or obsess about social media or things that are written about himself, he's, you know, he's... He's someone who's got his finger on the pulse and obviously was very well aware of the commentary that was going on. So he basically sat down on the Thursday at the end of the tour and said to his staff, if we are going to talk about this, we really have to address the elephant in the room. And I thought it was quite a clever and quite carefully worded statement. It was very much along the lines that the Queen has always said, we are here to serve you. How can we do that? You know, we don't want to come here and uh, tell countries how the way they should run themselves. We want to listen to you. And it seems like it was really well received on the ground as well. Like even yesterday, I saw some footage of the Prime Minister of the Bahamas um, talking to the legislature out there. And he was repeating William's statement as part of a wider discussion and saying, I absolutely agree with the Duke of Cambridge you know the future of the people of Bahamas is a matter for them and it's something that we as their government are going to con continue to listen to and to reflect the will of the people so there was quite a lot of praise for William certainly in the Bahamas for this statement that he released at the end of the trip and then we had your exclusive on Monday about William's blueprint for kingship some bold stuff in there about you know the end of never complain never explain cutting down staff and engagements and the need to be agile yeah, so when William released this statement, the first thing to my mind was to find out how he did it, why he did it, when he did it, what the thought process was behind it. So I, I made a lot of inquiries and I think what it boils down to is this. It, it, it's, it's a glimpse into the way that William wants to 
uh, act and to work as Prince of Wales and, and eventually as King. Um, you know, I've described it as a blueprint, but you know, and it's still a work in progress, I think, but we're getting a very different idea of the kind of ruler he wants to become. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is, is not subscribing to this mantra of never complain, never explain. I think he thinks it's served the Queen brilliantly over the years, but we are now in a different century. We have different means of communication. And I think he feels that the monarchy just maybe needs to be a bit lighter on its feet when having, you know, being faced by these big contentious issues. I don't think we're gonna get a lecture from him every day, thank goodness. I don't think anyone needs to hear that from any member of the royal family. But I think he just feels that always trying to rise above the fray might not always be the most appropriate course of, act, course of action in the future. And then, of course, uh, Prince of Wales has said he wants to see a slimmed down monarchy. He's made that very, very clear. He doesn't want a monarchy, a bloated monarchy with lots of kind of elderly hangers on. But I think William seems to want to take that further and say he doesn't want to just see a bloated monarchy. He wants to take a bit of a size to the institution of the monarchy itself, make it a bit leaner, a bit meaner and a bit more kind of fit for the times. So I think it will be a fascinating few years ahead of us based on what we've heard in the last few days. Thank you, Rebecca. Let's hear from my panel again. Now, Richard Eden, by so openly declaring his goals for his kingship, he kind of lays down the court look for Charles, doesn't he, old William? He really does. I mean, it, yeah. was a, it was a great story by Rebecca. And I think for that reason, it was sort of made you think, and I'm sure, um, you know, made um, Charles and Camilla think back at Clarence House. Because the way that William was sort of talking, or his aides are talking, is kind of forgetting that he's not the next king. <laughs> that there is yeah. a man waiting to be king. <laughs> yeah. William is down the line. Um, and that's quite easy to forget. But I think it is a reflection of the fact that even when Charles is on the throne, it will be almost a sort of dual kingship with his son that all the time will assume, does William agree with this? Is this the way things will go? And it, it's very much will feel a bit like a sort of interregnum, shall oh, I say. It just must be so irritating for Charles Richard Kay. What do you think? Incredibly irritating. Yeah. And for years he had to put up with the spotlight shining on his late wife. And then as soon as William came of age and got a glamorous, gorgeous girlfriend and then married her and had lovely children, the spotlight shifted once again. It has been a, a really frustrating few years for him in that regard. And then obviously, you know, he was on tour in Ireland at the same time of this Caribbean tour going on. I, you know, I didn't know about what it. Tour? <laughs> so, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. That must I mean, be so irritating for him. It must be, but there again, that's really a, a, an issue for the palace planners. Why, yeah. why put two together like that when they would have known that William and Kate would overshadow the prince? Now, with William talking about this new age of agility in his mm. reign, does that sort of suggest that Charles isn't up to it? Um, no, I think that's a bit of a harsh inter interpretation. I don't know. You know um, well, we're here for the hard talk. Uh, I think yeah. perhaps he did feel a bit bruised by some of the um, criticism of the Caribbean tour, which, by the way, I thought was um, generally was outrageous. Um, you know, from the moment they embarked on that tour, there were people who wanted it to be a failure. So do you feel like he felt he needed to have a bold statement to turn it around? Possibly, but I don't think he should be sort of rising to the base of these people who are generally cheerleaders for Harry and Meghan and were looking for things to criticise from the start of it. You know, from what I've seen and what I've heard from people actually in the Caribbean, it was a great success. But, it, but from back here, there's all these people sort of um, giving their views on how it will be interpreted and, oh, the optics on this are bad, or the optics. God, I'm sick of hearing that word. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think it was a great success, and I don't think William should feel the need to sort of justify himself. Now, you'll know more about this than I will, Richard Kay, but I have watched The Crown, so I know a little bit about <laughs> the palace inner workings, and I'm just curious about, with that big institution and all its history, how much change can a modern king like William actually affect? Well, I think he can be an instrument for change because he's a young man of a, of a different age, a different generation from that of his father. And he, he, he's had a, an education quite outside the traditional palace education. It brought him into contact with all sorts of ordinary people. And I don't want to be patronising about this, but I do think that's given William a much better grounding for his future responsibilities than that that the Prince of Wales had. Mm. Um, so I think he can, it can uh, influence change, and I think William himself, by choosing, and he has now got a, a very different group of people around him, the courtiers, as we tend to call them, 
um, quite different sort of backgrounds from the traditional courtier, he can make some great changes. Mm -hmm. I think, the, as Richard said, that the great danger in that statement was he has completely forgotten about the rain that's coming up next. That could go on for some time before William has to discuss this issue of whether he'll be the next head of the Commonwealth. Yes, and although they do seem to chime, Charles and William, don't they, in their, in their desire to streamline the monarchy. And what I'm curious about there is, if you're streamlining, you know, part of the reason that the royal family is so popular is they get to see so many people and they get to so many events, but surely that risks that strategy for popularity if there's fewer of them to do that. Well, we saw the huge weakness of Prince Charles's strategy when Harry and Meghan up sticks and left the country. You know, his strategy was based around him, Camilla, William and his family, and um, Harry and, and his family. That was meant to be the future. Well, they've just lost a, a big chunk of that. And I was always uneasy about this strategy, frankly, because I think that lots of the affection for the monarchy has come from people who meet. It might be the Duke of Gloucester or it might be someone else coming to visit their um, event. The Duke of Gloucester. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> He's not on that picture. <laughs> and and it, it's that impact with the, with the royal family that brings those ties, I think. So I think it's always a questionable strategy, in my opinion. But well, I've, I've asked the question before and I'll ask it again. When can we start pushing Prince George out there? Poor George. <laughs> Let, let's, let's give him a few years. Let's give oh, I think he needs to start 18. pulling his weight. He, he, <laughs> he looked great at Westminster Abbey, though, didn't he? He did. He looked he fantastic looked in his mini dad suit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> bless George. But can, can the, you know, the, is there a, a way that Charles has previously expressed this desire for a slimmed down monarchy? Is that, is that actually possible, do you think? It, it is possible, and it will happen. I mean, we're clearly heading towards a monarchy modelled much more on those of the European crowned heads. Um, this idea of a bloated family standing um, from east to west on the balcony at, at Buckingham Palace, those days are, are going to end at some stage. Um, you know, there's criticism about the cost of the monarchy, and uh, Charles is very cognizant of that and wants to sort of reduce its, um, that, that element of it. I mean, despite this, you know, possible misstep of William temporarily forgetting that King Charles is coming before him, it does seem that they are very much aligned in their vision for the future for the royal, the royal family. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it's fair to a point, but William is, is his own man and he's going to be a very different kind of monarch to Charles. I mean, he's going to model himself on his grandmother, on the Queen. He's, he, he's, we don't know what William's views are on Except on he will complain and explain, apparently. Well, you say that we've never had this before, but I recall I've been around so long that this was a, a strategy that began in about 1991 and Charles and Diana were very much of the, no, we can explain and we will complain. And it began then and, and we saw it in all the television programmes and books uh, and we got a, they were a much more open couple. Uh, uh, sadly, of course, it, it coincided well, it? with the breakup of their marriage. Yeah.